friends, I am delighted that we are hosting this uh, this short documentary. Uh, I remember it was in my, my my first year as the dean of theological school when the Occupy movement began, and uh, uh, very quickly we got the news of what was what was happening, and uh, I and a good number of our students from Drew went to Wall Street to participate in the Occupy uh, movement. Uh, it was there where I began to see the significance of, uh, of people of faith coming together uh, across different traditions to begin to, to, to talk about, to address a significant uh, issue at that time that uh, people are passionate about. Uh, well, I, I, I participate in that uh, for, for several weeks, and uh, I, I remember vividly the, 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 a replica of the, of the Wall Street bull uh, being carried around as part of the uh, pro protest movement. So uh, it was there that I got to know Michael Alley, who was uh, who was then uh, serving in ministry in New York, and uh, I'm delighted over the years to uh, since since in, in theological education to also get uh, gotten to know Rosemary uh, McNutt, uh, president at Starking School of Ministry. So uh, this is. As you know, this is a movement that has grown. And uh, now when you see the, the word occupy, you, you can be sure that the roots of that goes back to that occupy movement that began 10 years ago. So I am delighted that uh, Bill McGarvey has put together this documentary and, uh, and is part of the panel with uh, uh, President Rosemary McNutt and Reverend Michael Alley. And we can have the... We are looking forward to the documentary and the conversation to remind us of what people of faith can do uh, in relation to significant social issues of our day. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Haskins, back to you. Thank you, President Kwan. We are delighted that Claremont, at Claremont School of Theology that we um, are an institution that takes very seriously interfaith religion, interfaith dialogue, justice work, um, and the intersectionality between race, gender, culture, culture, and, and faith. And so we are exceptionally excited to be um, here to host this this evening. I'd like to introduce to you uh, Bill McGarvey, who is the filmmaker. Um, he's an author and musician and also uh, works with the Fellowship of Reconciliation. And uh, Bill will host, co-host and moderate the discussion afterwards. And uh, Bill, take it over. Thank you very much, Dr. Haskins. And thank you, Dr. Kwan. It's really a pleasure being here uh, with you. As Dr. Haskins mentioned, uh, I'm the filmmaker of tonight's film, uh, who directed tonight's film, which is called uh, uh, Hashtag Occupy at 10. Uh, an oral history. And uh, the film is produced by the Fellowship of Reconciliation, whom I work with, and I've worked with for a number of years now, uh, doing media work with. Uh, the Fellowship of Reconciliation, some of you might be aware of, uh, we just had our 106th anniversary of our founding conference, who we founded in 1915, uh, after, at, kind of coming out of the International Fellowship of Reconciliation, which was started in Europe in 1914, on the beginnings of around the rumblings of World War, the First World War. Uh, so it is a peace and justice organization committed to pr propagating peace and, and justice throughout the world. Uh, you might have heard of uh, the Fellowship of Reconciliation. Uh, doc we've had many no luminaries who have been notable members of our community, including Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, who in his life um, named gave, lent his name to two organizations. One was his organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and the other was the Fellowship of Reconciliation. Uh, it is the fellowship is the oldest international, um, I believe, is the oldest interfaith and largest interfaith organization uh, in the United States. 
Uh, as I said, we were part of the international FOR founded in Europe in 1914, and uh, it is in 40 countries. There are 20,000 members and affiliates and chapters, uh, including uh, peace, uh, different peace fellowships from different uh, denominations around the world. Uh, I, we're happy to be here, uh, if nothing else, to have a conversation with some great people about the uh, about the Occupy movement and their involvement from a faith perspective tonight, um, which I think is a very important conversation, especially at schools of theology and seminaries around the country, about the intersection of faith and justice and, and institutional faith uh, expressions and justice. Uh, so we will be hearing from after the film from Resurrey, Reverend Rosemary Bray McNatt from Stars King School of Ministry, Reverend Michael Alec, uh, uh, from Portland, Oregon, from the uh, Public Engagement for Ecumenical Ministries, and then also Reverend Shonda Rani Ja, who is not here yet, but she's coming late. I believe she's actually taught at Claremont, so we're thrilled to have her come on board. She will be entering a little bit late, perhaps. But I will introduce the three participants uh, on the other end of this short 30-minute documentary. Uh, thank you again for coming, and please, if you have questions, you can enter them into the chat. We'll be happy to have a, uh, a robust conversation afterwards. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to share my screen and get you Occupy at 10. Enjoy. My name is uh, Matthew Arlick. Thank you. So my name is Nicola Torbett. Streets. My name is Nathan Schneider. Streets. Our streets. Our streets. Our streets. My name is Carolyn Clausen. My name is Shonda Ja. My name is Reverend Michael Ellick. I, uh, 10 years ago, I was the uh, minister of Judson Memorial Church in Greenwich Village and a faith-based community organizer, um, largely with the New Sanctuary Movement, but with a few other justice movements in town. 10 years ago, I was the senior minister at the Fourth Universalist Society in the city of New York. At the time that Occupy started, I was just starting my second year of seminary. Uh, at Union Theological Seminary in New York. I live in Oakland, California, which is where I participated in Occupy. Um, I am part of a uh, United Church of Christ congregation. And Ten years ago, I had just moved to New York City to start grad school at Union Theological Seminary. I was also at the end of my conversion process to uh, conversion to Judaism, and I was a member of Jewish Voice for Peace and had just gotten started in organizing with the chapter that was in New York City. Ten years ago, I was co-pastoring First Christian Church of Oakland with Tyomri Stan Wilson. This is not I first got involved in Occupy um, as a reporter for Waging Nonviolence. I was um, uh, this was the midst of the 2011 uprisings around the world. And from afar, we'd been covering all that had been going on in the Middle East and spreading across Europe. And uh, one of the things that we were really interested in was what happens before something like this, an uprising hits the streets. <laughs> My first sense of Occupy was that it uh, reflected a deep emotional need of a whole generation of people. And it was very exciting. It was very, um, can't believe they pulled this off. Can't believe everyone's staying. Um, can't believe everyone continues to watch. Um, so I was really intrigued by it. And I had, like I said, I had a lot of friends who were very passionate advocates for Occupy and for what it was doing and had some highfalutin very well educated, but very, I think, in my mind, 
not experienced anarchist analysis of, of how it was going to move. What pulled me in as it continued to swell day after day, week after week, um, was this did seem like a younger person phenomenon. It felt like a certain set of activists and a certain demographic. Um, not only did it seem that way on the ground, not exclusively, but that was sort of how it was getting hammered in the media. And you have to remember, I was in the business of trying to radicalize and activate communities of faith around issues, social justice issues in New York. And this felt like they were taking a huge leap forward in the analysis. And so um, I decided to get more involved and instead of just hanging out with my friends down there to kind of organize a faith space around this. To be honest, none of us quite knew what to make of it. It was exciting. It was, we'd never seen anything quite like it. And I also remember that it didn't quite fit any of the organizing frameworks that my friends had. And so that had, we spent a lot of late nights discussing, um, this doesn't quite fit in with what we learned about how to organize communities. Uh, how practical is this? Will it bring about change? Um, what is the meaning of this thing? I uh, didn't know anybody there. Um, they were not particularly interested in people of faith because uh, I had I brought that up um, at that time. That changed over the course of the movement here in Oakland. I think that what sort of initially attracted me to it was that it was this big tent. I mean, both sort of literally, there were lots of big tents there, um, but also, it, you know, it was very, you know, in a way that I had never experienced before in in, in movements was that it was. It really, there was everyone there, everyone was there, you know, from, you know, activists to labor organizers to, uh, to, to faith people to um, unhoused folks. Like what, what seemed to unify everyone was, um, was, was sort of rallying against uh, economic injustice. There were people on exercise bikes making smoothies, channeling their own energy to generate uh, electricity. There was the interfaith tent where there were people of, you know, Unitarian, Jewish, Buddhist, Muslim, uh, Protestant, Catholic, as opposed to some other actions where there's a there was a economic actions where there was a very strange and strained relationship between religious and non-religious activists where the, where there was usually a sense of Oh, we should have them. It's strategically smart, but we're really not in love with them. This had much more of an organic, oh yeah, we see spirituality is connected to this uh, work we're engaged in of anti-capitalism. I gathered enough information to know that they were meeting down at Judson. So I believe that that's how I began working with them. Um, there were just a lot of people in a lot of communities that were doing things that I cared about. Um, the issues, particularly around economic inequality, were very live at that moment. I was really excited by the 99% language. The slogan of the 99%. The language of the 99%. And the idea that all of our grievances were connected and that we had common cause and that the we could be quite large, actually, and quite pointed at a system that was only benefiting a few. And really, you know, more accurately, we're really, we're really talking about the 99.9% because we're really talking about such an extreme minority of, of people around whom, you know, most of the nation's wealth is concentrated. And it was the first time that people were talking about the 1% in common language. So we are here to support you. We are here to support you. From every synagogue and mosque and church. From every synagogue and mosque and church. To remind this country. To remind this country. That there can be no such thing as justice. That there can be no such thing as justice. Until there is economic justice. Until there is economic justice. Also a lot of toxic racism inside Occupy, it's worth mentioning. And that was so prominent early on, so clear 
clearly a lack of racial analysis that um, that was another thing we were working to kind of um, heighten the conversation. Well, you know, one of the things that became apparent is um, Occupy's willingness to confront the police, um, to taunt the police, to ask that people place themselves um, in front of the police. Uh, and people of color were like, uh, excuse me, this is New York City. And we already don't have a good relationship with cops here and you're placing our lives in danger. I think that that was one of the first uh, major moments where you could see Occupy people dealing with the idea that, hey, maybe this, this movement doesn't impact everybody in the same way. The problem is they didn't really respond well to that. Many of the particularly white people coming involved in this did not see a connection with police and with, with racial justice and racial injustice. This lesson about how economic injustice in this country is, is built on racial injustice and works through racial injustice and, and that the violence of the police became an education in that. Coming into the bulk of Zuccotti Park, this is a generational moment of people who have a certain view of themselves that do not have a um, unified philosophy, but have a general sense of disregard for the establishment, right? And a, and a, and a um, kind of broad sense of anarchism, you know, that, whatever that might mean to them in local context. But the church is the enemy on all those fronts, right? No matter where you're coming from, we know the church is full of bastards, right? Like, and so, yeah, we had a lot of people who really wanted to educate us as to how uh, terrible we were and, and how um, responsible for so much oppression. And, and I think any of the, and, and, and they're right. They're totally right. Like you can't uh, be a person of faith, I think, with integrity without acknowledging that the church itself has been the main perpetuator of empire forever and with no exceptions. There's literally no, I mean, there, there are individual exceptions, but not as a religious uh, body. So um, I think that um, obviously if, if you're still here and a person of faith working with the church after acknowledging that, now you're at a more subtle level of, of understanding what the role of the spirit is and what the role of the church is uh, uh, as an organizer for uh, justice issues. I think that Occupy Faith we had more clarity, but what we didn't have, I think in the same way, was the attention of great numbers of people that Occupy had because religion for a lot of these people still is the very last place they wanna be, which is another reason that people of color were not interested in that because even when we question um, the faith communities from which we come, we still have a deep respect for what faith communities accomplish. Uh, no matter what that community is. We didn't get broad respect until we showed up with the African-American community. That's what pivoted it, right? Like they were willing to kind of have us there, but when we showed up, we sh one of the uh, pieces we organized was the anniversary march of a black power march in the 70s that fell in that time period, like in October, some sometime in there, I can't remember the exact date. And we marched 10,000 people over the Brooklyn Bridge and ended up in Zuccotti Park. And this was not their event, not the occupiers event. This was the black church's event. And uh, then all of a sudden, you know, these people, some of them want to see this as a broader movement and, and you, know, you can uh, insult the white church, but it was much harder for them to insult the black church at that moment, which has its own problems and critiques. And um, so that started to change things. But but the other thing it did was reveal a lot of the tensions around race lines. So independent of religious uh, tensions with people of faith, um, the faith community showing up writ large was coming up as a very diverse presence with very different cultural marks in their mind for what the struggle is and where it started and how it manifests. What's interesting to me is sometimes the religious tension actually was covering some racial tension. Uh, there was a prominent, very committed to liberation theology 
church in East Oakland, a prominent black church that had heard about Occupy and created some space for some of the young activists, many of whom were white, to come into the space. Some of those young activists were activated by being in a religious space and behaved in ways that the church leaders found super disrespectful, right? Using curse words, saying derogatory things about the divine. Um, and I remember the the pastor saying, if you can't behave in church, you don't get to use our space. All we're asking for is to be respected. Whereas the young people were like, right, but the church has collaborated with blah, 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 you know, all the language. And so there was a tension of people who had only had negative experiences of church not seeing this one invitation as changing the narrative in contrast with folks who said, you know what, all of white America has always been against us and we're creating this space for you because we see this alignment and you can't even respect us in our own space, one of the very few spaces we have. We shall not, we shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the water. There's a great paper mache golden calf, which was so such a good visual image. I was there when they brought the golden calf. So the golden calf was a part of the processional. It was like a miniature of the Wall Street bull, but it was it was designed to be the golden calf. And they marched around the encampment of this thing and people loved it. I mean, it just, it was such a powerful symbol. James Saul from Catholics United <laughs> actually had this idea of a golden calf shaped like a Wall Street bull. And that was very exciting to me. Uh, this fits the way we were brainstorming, which is, you know, through archetype, which is have an image that tells a whole story to your heart and picks up on that cultural narrative. So this guy shows up and um, we put out the call and people showed up and we marched through the streets of lower Manhattan um, with this golden calf uh, over your head, which is a great experience. Uh, to have going past brunch people. Um, but then uh, that turned into um, kind of a regular gathering, faith gathering at Zuccotti Park. It's wrong for them. It's wrong for them. To build out corporations. To build out corporations. They do not build out the poor. They do not build out the poor. They're so concerned. So concerned. For the poor. For the poor. For the elderly. For the elderly. Already, when it was broken up, it was becoming an unsustainable place. And I think it was incredibly powerful to have that kind of gathering as part of the organizing and really kept me aware at all times of what we were doing and just how bad the consequences of our systems were and how much work it would take, not just at a structural level, but just how much like people work it was going to take and how hard building any sort of community that serves us all is going to be when we've been so badly harmed by the existing structures that we have. I think a lot of us were noticing that under the guise of ideological uh, conflict between 
such communities, not just the African-American church, which is not one community, but just to speak broadly for a second, um, a lot of behavior that is just at best microaggression, um, but just flat out racist with zero education or knowledge outside of their issue of how economics touches race in America in any way. I can think of a billion little conversations that reflect what I think became a general mode that this was, um, that you can't make a movement like this led by these people, right? And that if, unless race is at the center of an argument around economics and colonialism in America, um, that wasn't going to do. That wasn't going to happen, right? So Occupy was trying to be intersectional, but it, um, but it, it, I think on the ground didn't quite have uh, the experience, right? It, it still was being held by a few white guys. Was the perception? Um, I think a lot of people, as they deepened their understanding of the nature of the problem, started to recognize that maybe our frame here is all wrong. Going to Wall Street using language of occupation right Evo evoking colonization maybe that maybe everything about this is kind of backwards and in some ways you know when when black lives matter swelled up a couple of years ago a lot of these people had a had now you know a, a, a an analysis and a, a place to work from um to 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 be allies that you know that that occupy couldn't have been <laughs> My experience of protest in general is that there is something very spiritual around uniting people in a cause to push to make the world more just in some way. And Occupy was the largest and longest lasting expression of that I've ever found. So there were a lot of like transcendent moments, especially around the marching. And then the day-to-day -day realities of trying to organize together were very rough and tough and trying. There's one class I teach on social justice and theology, the class that I was teaching this past semester when they said, yeah, Occupy was just a flash in the pan. The Seattle protests were just a flash in the pan. The Zapatista movement didn't have any long lasting impact. Those resistance efforts to um, anti-poor people legislation of the 1990s didn't have any carryover. I asked the students, how many of you have been involved in the Wall Street, uh, sorry, the Walmart workers campaign? And most of them had been in some fashion. How many of you have been engaged in the fast food workers campaign of the past five years? And some of them had been. How many of you have been involved in the poor people's campaign? And most of them, almost all of them were. And I said, do you ever wonder what landscape led to those, to those current day campaigns being possible? And it hadn't crossed their mind. So they didn't see any connections. They hadn't been able to connect the dots. But for me, um, while I have my sadnesses and uh, heartbreaks over the ways that white privilege and, um, and a lot of other things played themselves out in those spaces, I do not think we'd be having the conversations we're having now about increasing the minimum wage, around access to health care, around people's active responses to how horrific uh, the COVID response has been. I don't think any of those things would be possible without the ground that was laid uh, in, in those days. The gathered community is always a spiritual experience for me. So when I saw all of us in our collars or in our hijabs or um, kneeling and praying that people would begin to see and to understand and that they would feel a sense of urgency. That was spiritual for me. And I remember one meeting we had at Judson with all of the different faith leaders and we were sitting in the circle and we were still working out what our relationship was going to be with Occupy itself. But 
I think it was Donna who decided that we all ought to read out loud the complete texts of Letter from a Birmingham Jail. Now I've read it any number of times, but there was something about hearing it out loud and hearing it in a community, a multiracial, multi-faith community of people committed to making a change and hearing in people's voices that they were being convicted by some of Dr. King's words. Because everybody loves Dr. King on the 15th of January, but nobody ever quotes from his really incisive things about what people have to do, why moderates are a clear and present danger, things about the economic inequalities and injustices that black people face. That's the part they never want to quote, ever. But to hear this group of faith leaders reading it and taking it in in a new way in light of this upheaval in understanding the economy and the injustice of it all. There is no conversation that we're having right now about economic inequality that could have taken place without Occupy. And I think people forget that. It's not that they, um, it's not that the inequalities weren't real, but they were invisible in some crucial ways. And Zuccotti and the other things around it and the language of the 99% and the 1%. Bernie didn't have that language. He got that from Occupy. All those things are the fruits of what at the time looked like a fruitless exercise. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, it's all a spiritual experience. If you're up, if you're downtown at 3 a.m. in a bar planning to use stilt to get over a gate to break into another church, then yeah, that's a spiritual experience, and it's one you're never going to forget. And, but, but uh, uh, less of an ecstatic, roomy, um, a religious experience, and one that comes out of friendship and discovery. I mean, some of the best friends I have in my life, I found in Occupy, and finding uh, people both in and out of the faith community who felt like they had a deeper analysis on what needs to happen to our civilization. Um, that was magic and it was like a lot of people got to find each other and so um in the sense that you know you need catastrophe to sort of re-scramble the neurons and have them reconnect uh, i found a whole universe of people who i felt like were having a much more sophisticated analysis on where we are as a people and as a culture and what is it going to take to knock that and uh, to me, that was magic and it was liberating uh, to not feel like I was alone on a few things. And um, and I think that to this day, I still work with people all around the country who I met in that time. It felt honestly like a glimpse of the second chapter of Acts when people held all things on, in common, you know, which is to say it felt like a glimpse of the kingdom of God or the beloved community in action. Um, so I think it, it raised the bar for me and my, what I expect from a community of people who say they're, they have a spiritual life. You know, I, I come up in this kind of Catholic radical tradition of, in which the street is a holy place in which, in which, uh, uh, you know, being, uh, you know, embracing poverty for the sake of justice is, you know, a very old, old game. And um, so the things that they were doing, the things that they were talking about, the idea of, of living your your values in the most radical way that you can in a, a, a space of shared community, you know, is to me incredibly core to to what the you know what the Christian movement is is all about. And so I actually felt in some ways more at home than I had in many religious spaces. And this is a mystery I still am sorting out. But you know I had I, I'm a convert. I became a Catholic when I was a teenager. And for years and years after I really didn't feel comfortable identifying myself as a Christian. I was so 
uncertain about that identification, about that identity. You know, being in kind of being present to and documenting and and even participating in in this protest movement, that actually that went away. I remember having this feeling of being in the subway. You know, coming. You know, I was I was going somewhere off the square and coming back one day, and just feeling like I am not in the real world until I get back there, right? And I I can't but help but imagine that that. You know, the first Christians felt that way. In terms of thinking about what I what I learned from Occupy is that um, is that movements also have seasons. You know, there's always that initial surge of of energy and productivity and hope that happens right at the beginning, and then there's usually an ebb. Um, and I find that sometimes people who are, are newer to justice work get very frustrated by that. I think one thing that I learned from Occupy in some ways is that, that the measure of a movement's success is not in how many people continue to protest. That, that the measure of a movement's success is how many people become radicalized and mobilized um, in a variety of ways. And, and how many people continue to do that slower and often you know, less exciting, but I think maybe more crucial work um, of organizing for justice. And I think Occupy is a great example of that. Thank you. Hopefully everybody were able to see and hear that pretty well. We've got a really nice sized crowd on here. So it's great to be with you all. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being here. Just wanted to say before we start our, our Q&A here that uh, we are recording this. So if you can't uh, stay for the whole event or if you have people, uh, organizations you'd like to share this with, we will make this available through uh, FOR's website, which is forusa.org which we invite you all to come down and visit us or any of the other organizations, certainly Claremont School of Theology and I know Star King School of Ministry would probably want to use it as well. So we will be making that available. Uh, we also invite folks to uh, add to the chat if they have questions. We'll be trying to keep an eye on that here uh, and we'll be uh, taking a look at that. I'd like to invite, if possible now, our panelists on to the call. Uh, they can just... Uh, May turn their audio on. So I'd like to introduce uh, Reverend Rosemary Bray McNatt, Reverend uh, Michael Ellick, and I'm not sure if Reverend Sanja Rani Ja is here yet. Hopefully she will be here, as we mentioned earlier, that she's going to be running a little bit late because she's, I think, teaching a class. But let me just a quick uh, introduction to, to our two esteemed panelists who are part of the film. Reverend Rosemary Bray McNatt is currently the president and the professor of Unitarian Universalist Ministry and Heritage at the Star King School for the Ministry in Oakland, California. But at the time of Occupy, she was the senior minister of the Fourth Universalist Society in the city of New York. Before answering the call to ordain ministry, Reverend Rosemary was an editor and widely anthologized writer for more than 20 years. She is a former editor at the New York Times Book Review, the author of three books, including her memoir, Unafraid of the Dark, a former contributing columnist to beliefnet.com, and a former commentator on MSNBC. Uh, Reverend Michael Ellick. Michael is uh, currently the director of public engagement for the Ec Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon but was a minister at Judson Memorial Church back in 2011. And if folks might not be aware, we might get to a Judson was really in many ways for the faith community ground zero during Occupy Wall Street uh, in 2011. In recent years, uh, Michael has co-founded the Common Table of Oregon and the Reckoning with Racism, uh, interfaith organizing projects rooted in truth, repair, and reconciliation. And hopefully if Reverend Sanja Rani Ja gets here, we'll be able to talk to her. She's the founder and former executive director of the Oakland Peace Center, a collective of 40 organizations working to create equity, access, and dignity uh, as the means of creating peace in Oakland and the Bay Area. In 2011, she was the co-pastoring the First Christian Church of Oakland. Uh, anyway, good to have you with us, uh, Reverend Rosemary and Reverend Michael. Great Thank to be you. here. 
having spoken to you both, I know we will have no shortage of great conversation here. I will try to stay out of the way as much as possible. Uh, and the, the, for folks who don't know, uh, Reverend Rosemary and Reverend Michael are old friends who have reconnected over Zoom uh, and have discovered they're both on the same side of the country on the West Coast. So this has been a, a nice little homecoming for them or reunion. Um, what I'd like to start with, and, and then the conversation should go any which way you want it to, is we're two years past the 10-year anniversary of uh, the closing of Zuccotti Park on November 15, 2011. Um, and uh, I'm glad we're going to have Reverend, hopefully, Sanjay, uh, Reverend Sanjay here to talk about Oakland as well. But now that the two of you are involved in Occupy Wall Street, one of the powerful elements of, the, of doing the interviews with you all and, and others in the film was this sense of both and in the way the comments you all made and, and many others made. What I mean by that is simply there was both great anger and disillusionment and also a sense of inspiration there, which I think for our audience here at Claremont School of Theology is kind of important in that um, we're talking about spiritual lives. We're talking about theology in which often there is not a black and a white answer. There is a sense of greatness. There's a sense of growth. There's a sense of a journey. Um, I love what Reverend Rosemary says. First of all, Michael has the great quote, which people are saying, let's face it, the church is full of bastards, which is my favorite <laughs> which is great. And I'm glad, and I think it's true. And everybody loves it. Oh, I love that line. Uh, but I want to call out something Reverend Rosemary says, where we were con listening to the uh, letter from a Birmingham jail to feel people here, to see people feel convicted by this. Yeah. So I guess my quick question to you is, uh, and love your answers is in the 10 years since as faith leaders as teachers and as and as uh, ordained ministers how have you felt convicted and how have your faith communities both answered or not answered that call or that conviction in your in your estimation and whoever wants to start reverend rosemary we could give you the first shot you know that's a that's a really good question i think that um the sort of toxic racism that both Michael and I um, talked about in the film um, may have led to, by the time the Black Lives Matter movement emerged, may have led to a certain amount of awakening. Um, I think that the criticisms that people couldn't hear when Zuccotti Park was occupied were things that made sense to them with some distance and the brutality of George Floyd's murder. Um, the part of me that's angry and frustrated is like, how many people need to die before you get this? This is late. You're late. But I do think that that critique, that ongoing critique about the, the toxic racism in Occupy probably fell on stony ground at the time, but may have awakened people in time for what we saw after George Floyd. It's still not enough. But it's more. Michael, do you? Yeah, I mean, um, I think I shared this in one of our previous conversations, but I think at the time, it was still radical to take a shot against capitalism inside churches that I would visit. Like, I felt like I was a scandalous human. And now that's commonplace, right? Like, ah, everyone's taking a shot at the old machine, right? And, um, uh, hey, Reverend, welcome, welcome to the table. Let me nice to stop to you. welcome an old face and friend from the West Coast. So good to see you. Hey. I didn't mean to interrupt. You were on a roll. Keep no, going. not really. Not really. Well, I'll just follow just Rosemary. Sorry. Good to see you. Glad you made it. Um, <laughs> I'll just say, though, I, I mean, for me, I think that, that there's still a worldview issue, right? Like, we have a fundamental crisis of worldview. And a lot of our Native leaders uh, and activists are calling out, like, how can you protest whatever it is 
with one hand, while with the other hand, you empower it, not just by your consumer choices, but by this core dualism that separates me from the planet, <laughs> from God, from each other. And it feels to me like until we get into that space of a real um, conversion of a worldview, then we're going to have a, this hobbled issue. Because I, I agree with Rosemary. I think we've, you can see progress, um, but the, the church is still is so much that it, it's inevitably blind to. And I don't want to pick the church out and pick on it past um, the rest of our society and culture, but it's a canary of this. Um, and I'll leave it at that for now so our friend can get a word in too. Reverend Sanj, I'll give you just to give you up there. We already introduced you because we hope we were living in faith that you were going to make it. So thank you for coming. <laughs> so we are people of faith. Uh, great to be here. We just finished the film. And that was the first question. I really asked because we're talking to a Claremont School of Theology and I'm talking to faith leaders and ordained ministers here. Uh, there was something wonderful about my interviews with you all where there was a sense of for everybody interviewed, there's a sense of this weird both and is the way I put it. In other words, great disillusionment and anger and a frustration with Occupy, and yet also great inspiration. And looking back, um, I don't want to say fondly, but looking back and seeing some sign real significance there, which I think is an appropriate conversation for a school of theology where we're dealing with the life of the spirit, um, which is often dual and both the hand and it's neither either neither this or that it's both and it's never black and white uh and and i love something that rosemary had said about being convicted by by um the letter from birmingham jail feeling that other ministers are being convicted my question was simply how have you felt convicted since then and do you think the church in your experience or your the students you're teaching how has that conviction changed or are you still feeling it or, or has it changed for you or are you seeing any growth or anything in the church? It's kind of a wide open. And then I want you all to just talk. So feel free. Am I feeling convicted about anything? And is the church doing anything? That was the question. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just laughing at the question. Yeah. I'm not laughing at your framing. <laughs> is it just a yes? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so let me let me say this about that. Um, I think what was the remarkable opportunity of Occupy from my vantage point was because I think partly because we were off doing it over here in a very local context, right? And in a context that had been devastated by predatory lending practices that were particularly targeting uh, our Black family, right? Um, and so it was this big national and global moment. And the places where we were doing concrete stuff was standing outside of a local Bank of America demanding that they not evict a Black family in West Oakland. I mean, in solidarity with the the, the family that was about to be evicted was the driving force in it. Um, and so there was something about it that was a moment of, I want to say, uh, reinforcement for me about <clears throat> what it means to need the work to be hyper-local while it is connected with the national and global, right? Um, and I think where I get convicted over and over and over again is the best movement work keeps doing that. I keep getting that reinforced, right? The folks like the movement for black lives is deeply committed to Palestinian solidarity. Um, the work that I do around worker justice in Oakland understands the impacts of globalization and the horrific conditions of workers in other countries. Those connections, the, the need to do the work in deeply local ways and to recognize how we're also part of a global movement, I think was something that on a good day, um, uh, Occupy helped us do and practice. Um, and I got to say, my favorite work that I do with students is students who I don't have to translate my context. Like I, I remember working with a class where I am talking very specifically about environmental racism and how it impacts my neighborhood in Oakland. And 
there was a student who has been pastoring in West Virginia for 20 years who said, oh yeah, I see how what you're doing is related to the work I'm doing around disinvestment in this former coal mining town and how we're trying to build community of solidarity. Um, so I think where I get convicted is that same place over and over and over, the need for the local um, and its connection to the global. And where I am most inspired by that is the students who are, are see, and seeing and applying things going on in other local contexts to their own and recognizing how a disinvested former coal mining town in West Virginia is in so many ways uh, living parallel experiences to the toxic triangle of West Oakland. Um, I think that that's, that's where I get excited about um, the connections we're making. And I actually think, and first of all, it's nice to meet you. Um, I think that being in New York when this was happening, you're reminding me that I felt that it was the exact opposite, that it was really hard to make those local connections in New York City, that I think people were doing this big picture, um, big philosophical idea about economic inequality that needed to get done, but that it was harder for all but a few pastors, for example, to connect in their local communities and make that connection for their people, um, for their parishioners. Um, and I told, I think I told the story when I was, we were doing this show last week. Um, I preached about Occupy, um, in my congregation in a multi-generational service, the religious educators had done this big monopoly board for us. And we had the kids playing monopoly and landing on park place and doing these sort of visual representations of capitalism. But when I started preaching about it, the member of my congregation who was a banker started talking back to me about how wrong I was while I was still in the pulpit. It was quite an experience. Um, it's never quite happened to me like that before, but it was a reminder that you get close, but only so close before people begin to react and respond. For other people in other communities, this stuff was immediate. Um, and I think that the degrees that I felt where we were successful in trying to make that bridge was, for example, the fight for 15. Um, a lot of folks who were in Occupy and wanted to see some practical on the ground stuff began to get involved with Fight for 15 um, and some other um, very local movements. But Michael, you did a lot of this a lot longer, so you may have some others that you can identify. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that in New York at the time, I mean, I think you guys are both right. I, I think there's a lot of uh, vectors here, but you know, we were trying to influence the budget of New York State, which That's was cutting right. housing, cutting um, a direct service for food, direct service, and so we had this thing. Okay, all budgets are moral documents. That's right. And like, and but it became this this. Um, it's like, like a marketing game. Like, what's the fastest way to connect what's in my life with what's happening out there, which is esoterica. Okay. But not only is it esoterica stripping across the stream, I have deep shame embedded in me if I do not survive in an um, American economic system. So if my student loans, if my uh, housing mortgage, like if I'm a family with these uh, monsters at the closet. I mean, we, this was true in my church. They didn't necessarily see themselves as victims. They saw themselves, you know, b uh, from a system set up with not enough seats at the table, which is built uh, to have people not succeed in it for, for concrete reasons. Um, but there's this sense of bootstraps and that, you know, prosperity uh, idea that, that somehow I'm bad and I'm ashamed. So that, too, became a barrier. And we came up, I mean, we had stunts, right? We had, 
you know, ridiculous. We did an exorcism of Citibank because it was like, I don't remember know, like, that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's embarrassing what you do in your youth, right? And and so it didn't work. Yeah, <laughs> let me tell you. Let me tell you. I didn't still take, possessed. <laughs> I'd need, I'd need a, a fire hose of holy Sorry. water, which They're we should ballpark possessed. some numbers around because, frankly, I I'd just be curious to see it. But but <laughs> but things like this, like we were, and so we could have. Um, but again, this is there's a, there was a cultural adjustment happening mm-hmm. um, sure. to thinking about these things as not just esoterica for financiers that that's what that part of the news is for, but that this is a justice issue that th- those budgets I tune out on are a shape of my value and my ethics and where I place um, the value of of uh, real world vectors of money, class, and power. Mm-hmm. Uh, not to to remove the spirit to some um, disinf- uh, or disembodied ethereal world, but that that these mechanisms have place here. That's hard for the church. Still hard for the church, right? And it was also hard to do it in New York with that particular administration. Because uh, yeah. I, when Cuomo yeah. had to resign, I was just amazed because I couldn't think of anything that could get him pride out of that seat. There yeah, nothing yeah. you could do to get him to alter that budget. We got arrested one afternoon sitting in front of his office trying to get him to change the education budget. Best night of jail I've ever spent. But but I want to say, too, I mean, that's a great point. I'm curious what Sonia's experience was. But, you know, part of your question, Bill, when you talked about o- the night Occupy got kicked out of Zuccotti Park, I mean, you know, it's like you talk about Martin Luther King. Everyone loves to quote the parts that don't talk about economics and where he really nails his racial analysis right. to the uh, to the goods and services world. Like, it's nice for him, time. like... You know, Glenn Beck likes to invoke Martin Luther King, but no Not one. that chapter. <laughs> oh, are you kidding me? So, but 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 on the ground, like, so here comes this movement of a bunch of punk uh, kids, and we've critiqued it. We we all share, uh, you know, but it's making noise in the twenty four hour media circle. Can't look away. And at some point, what I, the, part of the story that's not told about Occupy is that one night they shut it down. They just stopped it. And that they had the power across the country in a coordinated way with mayors on a bunch of call with the State Department, which we now know. That's right. To just stop it. And they did. They yep. could just, this didn't end. I mean, t- was it toxic? Yes. Was it poorly organized? Yeah. Guilty, guilty. I'll take responsibility for my foolishness in it. But, but you've got to say that this was growing. This was a surge internationally, and at one day, that engine that drove that uh, heat, they decided to just turn it off. And, and they I, have the power to kill our spokespeople, and they have the power to, to turn off mass global movements. Sorry, Rosemary. I, no, no, the reason I I'm, I'm jumped in about that is no, because no, I remember the night it closed. I was home. My husband and I are in bed. We're like getting ready to go to sleep. And the alert goes off on the phone. Because remember, everybody gets a text when yeah. something's going on, when people want you to be mobilized. And they're telling us that we need to get down there. But I was too far away. I was at the other end of Manhattan. And my husband didn't want me to go in the middle of the night. I'm like, well, let's at least find out what's happening. And there was a complete and utter news blackout with one exception. That's right. Al Jazeera, America, was down there broadcasting live. There was nothing on the local all-news station. There was nothing on CNN. There was nothing on BBC. There was nothing on anything except Al Jazeera. And basically, people woke up the next morning, and Zuccotti Park was gone. That's right. Period. And, um, you had a question, Mike. Uh, you were trying to re- re- uh, talk to Reverend Sean about that, about her. Well, question. I'm just curious as to how, what that felt like. I visited uh, Oakland with yeah. uh, Phil Loss, and we had yeah. that thing there, you know. Yeah. But but that I don't think I talked to anybody after the the yeah. park got clear. How, what was your experience of that? Well, it's interesting because um, so this is a hard uh, is a hard thing to share, but. By mid-January, a lot of us who were deeply committed to nonviolence, um, which included a lot of organizers of color, uh, well, you lifted up the name of Reverend Lawson, we had kind of drifted off by then anyhow, because Oakland was the one 
occupy movement that would not declare a commitment to nonviolence. Uh -huh. um, and, and there's still tension. I'm, and you know what? I'm kind of, in some ways, even though I am a deeply committed nonviolent activist, uh, there's a certain pride that I take in that because it comes out of uh, Black Panther roots, right? Uh, the Black Panther Party and uh, that sense of, oh, yeah, um, no one's, yeah, we're, we're all of a sudden anti-gun once black people have guns. Um, and the pushing of that conversation, I think, is profound. And, and, and the history of we have no Fs left to give um, in, in organizing in Oakland is in its own way really powerful. But that, and so I think that's part of why we committed to a diversity of tactics. The problem being that who gets away with that are the you know, the white kids coming in from Walnut Creek and breaking windows. Uh, yeah. and, the, and the people who don't get away with that are the, um, are, are the black youth from Oakland, right? Mm -hmm. So the disparate ramifications of that on communities who were a part of Occupy had really gotten to the point that a number of us who were longtime organizers uh, in Oakland had kind of drifted off. Um, and so I don't remember the moment that the park was cleared. I've got friends who were deeply involved who would be able to tell you exactly. Sure. I don't remember because by that point in time, I had said, there are spaces I can do my work in the ways that I need to do it that put me in, in relationship with longtime organizers of color. Um, and some of that problematic stuff had shown up enough that I had drifted off. Yeah. Mm. That's I mean, I'm another conversation for us, either publicly or privately, is the role of violence. And I mean, like on the streets of Portland now, this is the first yeah. time where I've seen a yeah. bunch of uh, organizers who would look like occupiers, Rosemary, yeah. from our perspective, we call them occupiers, you know, but who are these young organizers, black, white, uh, uh, armed, carrying guns. And this is uh, um, blatant and pervasive. I, I never saw this back then. There's a few people who had a gun. And intentional is my impression. Yeah, it's not boldly. just random. It's, no, it's not random. There's a strategy. There's a yep. logic to it. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And I think to some degree, it's a kind of um, evolution of what you were talking about in terms of Oakland and the Black Panther Party. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, I don't think it's accidental at all. Yeah. yeah that's I, right. I, I really, you know, that's a fascinating conversation. I would love to pick up on that. I do want to, there there's a number of questions from our audience. Uh -oh. I want to make sure right. I get to. No, good questions. Um, I want to get to the interreligious inter -religious nature of a lot of this, which I think is very important. And also yeah. for Claremont, which is, I was way ahead of the curve in interreligious interfaith yeah. education. So we're going to make sure we get to that. One great question from an attendee saying, I'm wondering if you can say more about the implications of race in the Occupy movement with the BLM movement through the lens of the ways the church has often perpetuated and actively abided by the systemic structures of racism, has the church been complicit? Who wants it? Who wants to take that one? <laughs> you start, Michael. No, no, you I don't want to. <laughs> yeah. We're dealing with the school of theology, clearly. Very well. Very I mean, I am fairly that. sure we're. I would wager money we're all on the same page on this. So any I, of yeah. yes, we're complicit. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, in what universe? Yeah, are we not a hundred percent complicit? And a lot of, I mean, some of my work now, and and one of my uh, colleagues is a Claremont student in this. Um, is was just that? I mean, when when uh, when the George Floyd protests started hitting here in Portland. Um, it just is hard for me as people of faith to play that same role that we played back in Occupy mm -hmm. when the church itself is this, uh, yeah, we have our homework to do. So we followed something closer to a truth repair reconciliation model to, to like use this energy, use this momentum to kind of go deep on like, you know, we, didn't, we weren't born here. We didn't, the churches didn't grow out of the ground. It stole resources from someone. There's, it's, there's, so, so naming that history has become really crucial for us. And, and how do we not just acknowledge it by unveiling all the truths that we don't want to acknowledge as the church? Totally don't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, but also the way in which our resources today are the direct inheritance of that privilege and of that um, colonialism. So, so what does it mean to say that out loud and start to mend relationships, not just by saying sorry, but, but, but I mean, I would argue through, through reparations, right? And those can, that can look like different things, but until we're serious, I mean, it's just talk. And yeah. so I, I've been proud of a lot of churches in the Northwest to try to 
delve into these hard conversations. But I mean, this is like, this is the work and this is the, this is the, the going deeper that I think we didn't, uh, didn't have the leverage to do uh, back during Occupy. And maybe we still don't, can't go as far as we'd like, but I will let one of my smarter colleagues uh, yeah, right. join in. No, oh, no, I mean, but it's, a, it's a, it's a really fascinating uh, question from my perspective as a black religious leader in a predominantly white um, denomination slash association. Unitarian Universalists have always considered themselves on the leading edge of progressive actions. And yet, the struggle around race has been difficult, persistent, um, often toxic, and continues to be that way, though there are still enormous strides that people are making. Um, from where I sit as the leader of one of our two schools in the movement, mm -hmm. uh, we've spent the past 25 years uh, trying to build a pedagogy that is meant to disrupt white supremacy culture. We are explicit about it and have been explicit about it for a long time at great financial risk to the school, yeah. <laughs> as in donors get up and say, see ya. Mm -hmm. um, that's changed. That has changed. But at the beginning, it was like heading for the exits. Um, there is... Let, let me rewind. I would never engage in this kind of work if I were not engaging in, in it in a religious community. I have no interest or desire to have the kinds of conversations about white supremacy culture that need to happen in the secular world. I might end up in jail somewhere <laughs> if I had to do it that way. But because people of faith have at least a common vision of the beloved community, you at least have some ground to begin. Um, for Unitarian Universalists, we've had a commission on institutional change where people are talking about, we've been talking about all the things that the world needs to do. Now it's time to talk about what Unitarian Universalism needs to do and the way it trains its ministers and the way it sets up its congregations. Are there other structures and other ways in which we can be the, anti, the counter oppressive, anti racist people mm -hmm. that we say we are? Um, and it's been a struggle. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to uh, lift up something that was really, that felt really important at the time and then felt like maybe it hadn't been that important. And now I'm beginning to think uh, has had some long-term effects in a positive way uh, about Occupy and its very complicated relationship to race. Um, my, so I, I was also uh Reverend Rosemary, I resonated with your story about preaching because, oh my gosh, we decided it would be, my co-pastor and I thought it would be really cool to do a, an entire liturgy using the people's mic, um, if you're not familiar. I love that oh, idea. You love it for the first 10 minutes, and after a while, you're like, that was a horrible idea. <laughs> what were we thinking? Um, so we thought we were super cute, but um, we, we had the service, and... As part of the service, we as a congregation committed to standing in solidarity with our indigenous family who were really troubled by the language of occupy or occupation for uh, yes. what would be obvious reasons. Yes. And they were proposing that we rename at least the uh, Oakland occupy, that we rename it decolonize. And so our church took a, uh, Ty Amri, my co-pastor, took a resolution on behalf of First, Co uh, First Christian Church of Oakland to that uh, assembly meeting, um, and it got voted down, and it was really painful, and it was really heartbreaking. Um, what I do have to say is the fascinating thing about all these new activists showing up and experiencing police brutality was they were like, hey, you all, things happen to people who protest. We need to do something. For those of you who are wearing earphones, I apologize. Um, and what was great is people of color. Um, this was really early on. I think the first time I ever heard the expression Columbusing uh, was in relationship <laughs> to the Occupy movement where we were like, oh, you all, 
Young white activists have discovered police brutality is a thing. Maybe we should do something about it. The, the entire Grand Lake Theater, which is a huge historic theater oh, in no. Oakland, um, got booked out for a conversation led by Black activists and organizers and Indigenous and Latinx um, and Asian, because we do all of the things here, um, talking about the history of police brutality. And so that mattered. The conversation, while it failed in some really painful ways around uh, decolonization and indigenous land rights, um, showed up. And I do think that that has had a ripple out effect. We're having conversations uh, that are better informed, that are more strategic around solidarity with indigenous land rights con uh, work today, mm -hmm. that for many people were seated back uh, 10 years ago. And I think similarly, some of the good work that we've done and younger generations have really carried the ball on around transforming uh, systems of public safety um, in anti-racist ways has some origins in how badly folks screwed that up during Occupy and some of the conversations that were forced as a result. Maybe I'm over um, inflating that, but I think there are some connections that I see among the organizers I work with who were young and naive activists back then. You are reminding me about the pieces of um, my sort of circling the Occupy yeah. camps around the decolonizing yeah. argument and yeah. how it got no traction yeah. in New York. None. Can and I... I Blank that out until you said that just now. Um, I'm, I'm loving the conversation. I know a lot of people online are as well. We have about eight minutes left, so I uh -oh. don't want to rush you. But the good news is I really hope, I know uh, Reverend Shonda and, and Reverend Rosemary have thought about doing screenings at their own institutions or at other affiliate institutions. We'd love to do more, so please stay in touch, Great. folks. And as I said, we'll have a recording of this. But a couple quick questions from an interreligious perspective, um, if we can, because we're at Claremont, and, and th th this was, and then I'll invite Dr. Haskins to come back on afterwards. But um, one question was from somebody in an interfaith setting. We talked about the uh, letter from the Birmingham jail. Are there any other texts that are equally convicting that you know of? And then uh, in, in, in for an interfaith audience. And I guess one of the things that I, this is very much a kumbaya moment this, this, in, in terms of all of us talking, but was there any interreligious stress or strain? I mean, we're, <laughs> it can't Sorry. all be. No, it can, I mean, and not simply, I know Michael had some problems with Trinity. <laughs> Oh, no, that Michael. I'm sorry. I was thinking about a different Michael. Yes. No, but, but please talk about it if you can. Just and then, and then if you can, I want you to promote what you're doing now and maybe challenge our, our viewers with one thing you, went, you wish they could take either some action they could take or something concrete they could involve in or should look into now. So I know that's a few different things, but it's been a religious. In eight minutes, action. seven yeah. minutes. Awesome. Yeah, if you can. Well, you know, I know people's time is valuable, but whatever you can do. Well, I'll just start by naming some of the interfaith tension I think was strong. And, uh, you know, before that, I was an immigration organizer. I did, I helped launch the New Sanctuary Movement. There was a real divide between black and brown activism in New York City and across the country. And, and one of my goals was to bring different communities into Occupy. That was like kind of how I thought of. Yeah. And that played out in tensions, right? Like, I think there was a lot of prominent African-American organizers who uh, are not interested in taking uh, orders or direction from this scene. And so that, that yeah, that, those tensions were there and they were predictably there. Um, but what I want to throw out too, is that there were beautiful moments that don't get recorded. I mean, we love to look back and critique yeah. and I'm the first one to want to yeah. do it, but there were moments where communities that I could never get together around certain issues before Occupy because of the, I'll, I'll just say spirit, because of that fever of being down there. You know, I, I mean, we had um, Jesse Jackson came in with the Rainbow Push Coalition and all their local pastors, and this was problematic, right? Uh, they had their own way of doing business. They had their own way of, and it wasn't always inclusive. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, it's just what it is, right? But but there were relationships built there that held us in good stead for a long, long time. So yeah, the tensions were there, but that's almost too obvious. I, I would argue that the more subtle surprises were where we built solidarity yeah. by recognizing 
that um, a, you know underneath racial differences, underneath immigration political differences, um, we had this that all budgets or moral documents thing allowed for some connections that had never been made. It wouldn't have happened otherwise. Yeah. And, and like, so yeah, there were tensions, but I, I felt like for all the things I like to look back and like critique my past self on or critique occupy on yeah. that was, uh, that held us for a long time. Those, and those, a lot of those relationships still yep. continue. And I'll hand it off to my friend. Um, I just want to say something about uh, the person who asked about other liturgies that were helpful. I, I can tell you what I'm finding helpful lately. Um, there is a professor of worship at Union named Claudio, uh, and I'm pronouncing his last name wrong, Calvajes. And I'm going to talk to chat. I'm sorry, who said it? Calvajes. Calvajes, that's right. And it's a it's a book called Liturgies from Below, Praying with People at the Ends of the World. It is an astonishing piece of work. I love it. I just found out that I'm supposed to be at a conference where he's going to be. So I'm bringing all my books with me so he can autograph them for me. It's just beautiful and powerful and speaks to this moment um, of activism, even in the face of terror and disaster that I think everybody should get. I love that. Um, brief. So brief story. Uh, our tensions ha ha were a lot more generational than uh, across faiths. I think because a lot of the folks in the interfaith movement had been organizing together for a long time. So when, when Occupy chose not to, uh, commit fully to nonviolence. There were some schisms there. There was a very well-known uh, rabbi deeply committed to nonviolence who was like, you all are stupid if you stay involved in Occupy because they can't be bothered to, and it's going to be destroyed by its lack of commitment to nonviolence. Uh, and when things unraveled, he reached out to all of us and said, bet you feel stupid now. And I was like, I don't think you're doing nonviolence right. Um, so I remember wow. that being, um, I remember that being a significant issue within our movement because a number of us did choose to be in that space and embody nonviolence in the midst of recognizing why some people didn't see that as valuable. Um, but I do think, I mean, much like, um, much like Michael was talking about, I have seen people continue to organize together because of the relationships that were built. Um, these days, I'm helping organizations be less racist. Um, that's kind of my full time job. <laughs> uh, As a they, tired person, thank you. <laughs> they say you either die an organizer or you live long enough to become a consultant, and I feel a little bit ashamed, but it's important work. Somebody's got to do it. Um, and so I, I, what I do find really inspiring is uh, remaining committed to worker organizing, uh, remaining committed to solidarity with low wage workers, um, because I think that's actually how I stay connected to the intersection of faith and justice, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the workers I'm with are so deeply faithful, whether it's to a church or synagogue or mosque or whether it's to a movement that they keep me honest um and keep me grounded so i think everybody everybody should be doing wor uh worker organizing and worker solidarity that's great thank you so much I, there was a question from one of the students here i'm not sure we're going to get to it dr kwan has, has jumped in so i'm assuming time is up but uh curious about whether why we're not discussing the strength of virtual movements via social media slash big tech as perpetuating injustice and escalating violence um Big question, uh, Dr. Kwan, I'm assuming we, we probably were out of time. That's a whole nother hour. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. important stuff. Mm -hmm. we'll, sorry. It's a great question, though. It so is. I think I want to affirm that. It absolutely is. And I want to affirm every, uh, please, folks, if we can, I mean, to support the organizations, uh, Reverend Rosemary, Reverend Michael, and Reverend Sonda are, are a part of, it doesn't mean financially necessarily if that's great, but I mean, more just the fact that we're talking, that we're networking together, that the Reverend Sean and Reverend Rosemary are in the same metro area and don't know each oh, other. Oh, yeah, anymore. we have to. We Things have like to this have to change. That. Reverend Michael needs to get in touch. And, and honestly, I, I just hope, I mean, this is not, but getting in touch and being and working together and networking like that is just incredibly important. This is where the, I think the work of 
the spirit is, is involved. So anyway, sorry to thank and you. And we're grateful time. to you, Bill, for making this film. Oh, I've had, I hope we can do more of them. And I know you're all busy, but it's been the thrill for me. So thank you so much. And Dr. Kwan, I can, I'll give it over to you if you want to. Well, uh, thank you so much. I am so deeply, deeply grateful the, that the, uh, uh, the four of you have taken time to come and, uh, and, and speak to us at Claremont School of Theology. And, uh, uh, the issues that that you have talked about are issues that are very close to our hearts and and our reason uh of of being a a school of theology a, a graduate school where we we are we are in the business of producing leaders that there will be activists as as well in in all different ways that they are called to to their ministries and uh, uh, I'm 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 grateful because this this kind of movement is, is what brings people together, as as all of you say. And the the uh, the interfaith component is is highly value uh, highly value for us at Claremont School of Theology, and and it is it, it is the, the 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 collective the the coming together that we can continue to 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 create new movements. Uh, virtual movements, whatever movement that, that needs to be created, because there will be social issues that will keep coming up, and and this issue that that all of you were involved in, uh, in relation to to Occupy Wall Street, uh, it is still with us. Look look at the pandemic time. Uh, this last couple of years, who 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 have earned more wealth than the rest? when people are suffering. And, uh, and, and we are not even talking about 1%, we are talking about less than 1% who have, who have been incredibly uh, enriched through this pandemic time. So, so this, is, this is not a movement that, that is dead, but it is, a, uh, it is some uh, that the a tremendous work that is still ahead for all our students, all our communities is, is enormous. So I, I just want to, to, to thank you and, uh, and on behalf of the School of Theology to, uh, to, to show our deep appreciation to, to Bill for, for doing this and uh, for all of you to, to, to be part of this documentary. So thank you. Thank you very much. You. Let me hand it over to Dr. Haskins. You're muted, I think, Dr. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. This has been such a rich um, discussion. And um, as President Kwan said, it's always ongoing. And we thank you for your time 10 years ago and for the seeds that it has um, planted and that new generations will continue to uncover. So thank you for that. And for our students, um, we hope that this discussion and this movement will be um, fruit for you to constantly climb to the end of the tree to find. And may you, it enrich you um, in your studies. So thank you all and have a good evening.